The Super Bowl is one of the greatest moments in sports. The entire world is watching. And what happens to us when we watch the Super Bowl is we tend to forget the journey of the people that are in the Super Bowl. If you look closely at some of the people that are playing in the Super Bowl, you'll find that many of them had a very similar journey. In this week's Torah portion, we just read, it begins with a commandment that God says of us to get oil, olive oil, and use it for the near Tamid. And the Torah uses a very specific language that I want to delve in together with you. V'etat etzavetz b'nei Yisrael, command the Jews, v'yichuei lecha, and you should take shemen zayit zach, pure oil. Kasis la ma'or, crushed for illumination. La'alos ner tamid, to raise up the ner tamid, the constant flame. And if you look closely in that sentence, you'll find a couple of things are a little off. First of all, la'adlos means to raise. Really, when you talk about a candle, it's really to light, which is la'adlik. It's the wrong word. The second thing is, if you notice in the sentence, it tells us that they have to be crushed. We know they're going to be crushed because that's how you make oil. You know it's crushed because you see oil. You don't walk into a store and take out the oil and be like, hey, were these olives crushed? Yeah, that's what happens in your olives. There's oil. Had God said, take oil, we would have been good. But he adds, kasis lama or, crushed for illumination. Lahalos near tamid. How come? So let's delve in for a second. Oil, olives represent something. They're a fruit that's bitter. Olives, there's a Gemara Menachas that speaks about this, olives represent the times that are challenging, times that are bitter, times that are hard. What Hashem is telling us is that when you take the times that are hard, the olives, and you crush them, and you work them, and you, you, you engage in them, what's going to extract from that is a source that's flammable, that's on fire. If you want to know how to raise yourself up in life, if you want to know how to grow in life, you have to not only wait for the sweet times. You have to recognize that in challenges, you have within the challenge, in the olive, in that challenge that you're going through, the opportunity to extract kusis lama or you're going to crush it you're going to work it to illuminate because you know that this thing is going to light you up when you are crushing the olives for the near tamid hashems understand hashem says these oil these olives that you're crushing you're doing it to illuminate this kayak here this power to the challenge, this power to the bitterness. Because when you're done with it, you know what you're going to do? You're not going to lahat leak. You're not just going to light the candles. Lahalos ner tamid. You're going to raise up. Because when you crush, and when you work, and when you engage, and when you don't let it to take over you, when you go after and you're able to see challenges as an opportunity, we should never know pain. We should never know suffering. When Hashem sends you a challenge and you look at that challenge and you say, within that olive, within that challenge is the liquid that I'm going, it's going to lift me up in life. I'm going to be a near tavern. I'm going to be a constant set of illumination. I'm going to be, I'm going to extract that soul of mine, which is compared to flame, to fire, and bring it out and live with it more. The challenges is what brings out your illumination and what raises you up. But you got to go into it with that mentality. You got to know that whatever you're going through is what can make you great. If you look closely on the field today, you'll see there's a man named Joe Burrow playing. I don't want you for one second to think that Joe Burrow was born with a football in his hand. Or Joe Burrow is as smooth as he is, depending on it, no matter how the game is going. It don't matter if they're doubling Jamar Chase, it don't matter what Sean McVay has as a plan. Joe Burrow is a superstar. But he became a superstar because nobody picked him up as a kid. Nobody drafted him out of high school. Nobody drafted him out of elementary school. Scouts told Joe Burrow that he had no shot. He was not a five-star recruit. And in fact, he ended up in Ohio State in college, played behind, I think, J.T. Barrett, 
and he was told that he had a chance to start and when it was his turn he was passed over for another quarterback and he had to leave Ohio State Joe Burrow began his career in a small little town it's not it was not sweet he overcame challenge in the football world after challenge after challenge after challenge after disappointment got passed over then went to LSU started again and in every single snap and when you watch Joe Burrow play I want you to look closely in the second half watch the resilience you can smell it that Tom Brady-esque resilience it's the resilience of someone that was picked 199th Tom Brady it's the resilience of the kid that was once told you're not good enough it's the resilience of a person who is opposed to being knocked over by somebody benching you going back to the weight room and going back to the field and working it and working it and working it and never giving up on yourself and never giving up on your dreams and never giving up on who you are until you get it right and when you get it right you come on the field with a different resilience he doesn't go down like everybody else you don't come to the NFL get injured come back and drive a team to a, to a Super Bowl when the whole world says there's no way you're beating anybody win after win watch him play and if you watch closely you're going to watch a kid who is Lahavdil Kossis Lamor this isn't Rochnias we're talking about Super Bowl so we have to make sure we're aligned properly it is Lahavdil but you can learn from him Cusses Lamor. He's worked himself because he knows he's going to illuminate. He, every challenge, every struggle, every time they told him no, every time they benched him, every time they hit him, every time this guy gets hit, gets right back up and here we go. Every time they say you're not good enough, every time the Bengals aren't supposed to be here. Whatever challenges you're going through, whether you're 13 or you're 93. If you're alive, you got challenges. That's how life works. Whatever you're going through, if you stare at it and say, in that challenge, Gam Zu Latova, in this challenge is going to be something that's going to light me up. Maybe I won't know until tomorrow. Maybe I won't know until I'm older. Maybe I won't know until I'm, I'm in Eretz Yisrael. In, in Eretz Yisrael, my head. Olam Haba. Or Eretz Yisrael with Mashiach. Or Eretz without Mashiach. I may not know for a while. But I know that if I've got a challenge, it's going to make me great. Then what's happening is you're playing in your own Super Bowl. Because what is a Super Bowl? It's just a game of the people that are the most resilient. It's just a game of the people that have been able to never get knocked down by challenge. It's just a game of people that have been working their whole lives knowing that challenges are making us great. And if we watch the game and we walk out and we think it's them, we're missing it. Each of us has our own game to play. Each of us have our own challenges to overcome. And we have to know in our core that Hashem brings us a challenge to make us great. We should never know pain and suffering. Every time we deal with an olive in our lives, something bitter, crush it to illuminate and if we do it'll be lalos it will raise us to becoming a true near tamid i'm deeply grateful to the office of chazak for giving me this great opportunity to speak to so many of you across the globe today the title that i would like to call this presentation is super lessons for life this is being live streamed during the halftime show of the super bowl and I would like to show you three important lessons that we can learn from football. Two of them will be from Super Bowls of previous years. The first one I'd like to talk about is the 51st Super Bowl, which took place in January of 2017. The New England Patriots were playing against the Atlanta Falcons. Now, in the third quarter, there were only eight minutes left in the third quarter, and Atlanta was leading 28-3. to No team ever in Super Bowl history had come back from a deficit of 25 points. And yet, remarkably, Tom Brady, who is probably the greatest quarterback ever who recently retired, he was able to 
orchestrate and bring the team back and eventually they won the game in overtime 34-28. How did that happen? What did that prove? You know what it proved to me? That you can come back. You could be so far behind and millions could be convinced you're never going to come back. But if you surround yourselves with good people and you're determined like he was, you can do anything. He had great players alongside him. They recovered fumbles. They sacked the quarterbacks. They made great catches. Now, let's say that you want to come back in Chuva, for example, let's say in Tvila. You feel you haven't been davening well. What do you do? You surround yourselves with mentors, with chavrusas, with people who can show you what it means to daven well. And you do one play at a time, just like he did, slowly but determined. You're not going to go from not having kavana at all to having kavana davening the next day. Take Shema Yisrael. Work on Shema Yisrael. Learn the meaning. Then, a week or two later on Ashrei. Then on Shema Nezra. One play at a time. And if you do that, and the same thing with learning. You feel you're so behind in learning today, you couldn't learn anything. Online, you have the greatest Yorim on Daladov. Rabbi Bornstein. Rabbi Stefanski, so many people on Shas Illuminated. You can have Mishnah, you can learn anything. You can always come back. Just be surrounded by good people and just be determined. That's the first lesson of 51st Super Bowl. You can always come back. The second one, the second lesson, well, many of the younger people that are watching probably never even heard of this name, but the older people who are listening, and if they're football fans, they will never forget the field goal kicker who came from Cyprus. His name was Garo Yapremian. Now, you have to see this to believe it. It was unbelievable. He was very short in football standards, only five foot eight. And this took place in January 1973, 47 years ago, the seventh Super Bowl. The Miami Dolphins were playing against the Washington Redskins. And this guy, Yapremian, was a great field goal kicker. He led the NFL three times in field goal accuracy, but he made one of the worst mistakes ever as the game was winding down. There was only a couple minutes left. Miami had a perfect season. They won every game of that year, and they won every game in the playoffs. That was going to be the only time ever in history that a team will have won every single game. Now, it's only a few minutes left of the game. The Miami Dolphins are winning 14 nothing. And Yapremian was going to kick a field goal, which would have made it 17-0, and the Redskins would not be able to come back. But instead, he didn't kick the ball high enough, and it was blocked, and it came back to him. Now, this short little guy never prepared for this situation that he had the ball. Everybody was coming to tackle him. What he should have done is fall to the ground and take the loss, but that's not what he did. He tried to do something he never did before. He tried to throw the ball. Of course he couldn't throw it. One of the Redskins picked it up, ran it back for a touchdown, and now instead of 17-0, it was 14-7. And the Redskins could have won the game. They didn't. Miami was able to hold on, and they had the perfect season. But what did we learn from that? If you are not prepared for a pressure situation, you're going to do awful things. And you know something? He was never prepared for the ball coming right back to him. And that's what is in life. Dovra Melach writes that in the very first passing in Tilam. He says, Ashri holach Don't go in the way of evil people. Over there, Chatoim Loy Omad, and don't stand with sinners. Over Meshav Leitim Loy Yashem, and don't sit with those that are jesters. And Rashi tells us, if you don't go, you're not holach, then you won't stand, and then you won't sit with them. Be prepared. If you're going with a group of guys, you know they go into a place they're not supposed to go to. Don't go along and say, okay, I won't go in. You know why? Because they're going to pressure you. At the end, you're going to go in. You're going to a kiddush and you know there's going to be a lot of drinking there. And you know you shouldn't be drinking. Don't go to the kiddush. Because if you see all the chaver drinking, you're going to drink as well. You're going out for lunch, whether you're a boy or a girl, and you've got a half hour until you get back to school. Don't sit and talk until 27 minutes, and then when you're supposed to bench, you're rushing the benching. That's the whole thing. You want to say thank you, Tashem, that you're able to have a pizza. You're able to get, go out with friends. Stop in advance. Think about it. I've got only 30 minutes for this time between periods when I go back to school. So therefore, I've got to prepare that I should have time to bench. Prepare in advance. Prepare for the difficult situations. And finally, the third lesson that I think that we can learn is what I'd like to call the two-minute warning. 
Now, the two-minute warning was instituted in 1942, by the way, in the NFL. And basically what it is, is right before halftime or right before the end of the game, there's two minutes so that the field, so that the teams can regroup. But I want to tell you a great story. Many years ago, the Rosh Hashiva of Turbidas, Rabbi Avram Pam Zechatzadik Bekarish Lavrocha, he dominated in a certain shul. He wasn't the rub in the shul. And there was somebody that was very sick. And Rav Pam couldn't go visit him in the hospital because he's a Kanyan. And you don't know in the hospital there could be dead people there and the morgue, so he couldn't go in. But he wrote him a letter. And this man was so touched that the Rosh Hashiva, Rav Pam, wrote him a letter. He kept it under his pillow. And everybody who came in, he showed them that letter. And not only that, a few months later, Nebuch, the man passed away. And one of the Rabbanim that spoke at the Leviah said about this man, you see how Chashiv he is that Rav Pam wrote him a letter. The great Rosh Hashiva Rav Pam took the time to write him a letter. And they told Rav Pam about this. They said, you see what your letter did? It accomplished so much. He gave him chizik, he kept it under his pillow, he showed everybody, they mentioned it by the Hesped. Rav Pam said, oh, that's so frightening to me. He said, why? He said, why is it frightening? You should feel good about it. He said, how long did it take me to write that letter? Two minutes. How many times do we have two minute spans that we just waste and we don't accomplish? I'm so frightened that when I get to Shemayim, Hashem will tell me, look what you accomplished in those two minutes. There were so many other two minute spans that you could have accomplished things. And that's the thing that I have to remember, that we have to remember. Rav Palm is giving us the two minute warning. He's the referee who's telling us, you got two minutes, don't waste it. Maybe say tell him for a chayla. Maybe take out a chomish and learn some chomish. Learn a halacha mission or whatever. You could call a person that's lonely. There's so many people today that are lonely and hurt and feeling out of it. Call them. Make them feel special. And I believe, you know, when I go to Poland and I take people to the cave of Sarishnir, you know what she had up in her school? This boss can tell him, Per Tzadik Pasikid Beis. Lemnois Yamenu Kein Hoida. The simple meaning is, Hashem, tell us how many days we have left so that we can accomplish everything that we have to. But you know what she said? She said, count your days, make every day count. And she used to tell the children, count your days, count your hours, know that every minute, every second counts. That's the two minute warning. You know something? We all live in the field of life and we all have goals. You wanna have a goal? You wanna have the ultimate field goal? The ultimate field goal is in the field of life. Make sure and know that you can always come back, prepare for precious situations, and remember the two minute warnings. Then you'll accomplish the ultimate field goal. Thank you. Since 2006, Chazak has inspired thousands of people via its numerous life changing programs. From little children to teenagers, from men to women, from yeshiva students to young rabbis, and everyone in between. Chazak touches them all. Educating, inspiring, and guiding thousands throughout the year. Okay, my friends, so I have a story to share with you. I heard this story a long, long time ago. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if it's true, if it's not true. It's irrelevant. The point is still the point. Fill in the blank with the person whom you've heard the story with. But here's the way that I heard the story. There was a basketball player. I know, I know it's a football game. Relax, relax. There was a basketball player by the name of John Havlicek. John Havlicek played in the Boston Celtics in the 1960s. And there was a, uh, it was said about him that he was a serious, serious worker. A guy who put everything, he, everything into the game. And he worked very, very hard. And... Um, it was said that not only was he someone who worked you know, during the game, but he was always the first one by practice, and he was always the last one out. And uh, it was so, so dedicated, so dedicated. Story goes that once there was somebody who decided they wanted to beat him to it. So they got up very early in the morning. They got up very, very early, and they said, I'm gonna go to the court, and we're gonna see if he's there yet. And what happened, lo and behold, when he gets to the court, what does he see? He's there already. He was already there, he was already practicing, he was already suited up, he was already in the middle of his warm-up. Amazing, we've heard this by other sports players and by other people as well. Such a dedication, such, such power, such a beautiful thing. Well, I wanna I want share with you a Gemara. The Gemara is found in Megillah. And the Gemara is, is on the, uh, the bottom of Chav Zayin uh, Mabes. And the Gemara says like this. It says that Shaulu Tamidav is Rav Prada. The Tamidim asked Rav Prada, Ba Meher Rachta Yamim. 
Why were you Zoha to live a long life? He lived a very long life. He said, why were you Zoha? He prayed a very long life. Gemara in Erevin, I think it's in Erevin, Daf, Nun Dal, I think Tosas brings it down. He says, like, whoa, 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 how is it that you lived such a long life? What were you Zoha to do such a thing? You see if Tosas? Erevin, yeah, Nun Dal, in base. So what, what exactly, what did you do? So he says, my whole life, lo kidmani adam the base medrash. No one ever beat me to the base medrash. I was always the first one to the base medrash. Now we take a look. You see, look at this guy, John Havlicek. You look at all these different sports players. Look at all these guys. Look how dedicated they are and where they come up and how they do amazing things. So we contrast with contrast that with other people. And I want to take you earlier. The Mepreda, earlier the Mepreda. Perhaps, I mean, it's reminiscent of, of maybe where did he get it from even? If, if you take a look, we find in Pasha's Bullock, Perichav Beis, Pasach Chafalf, it says, Vayakam Bilam Baboker, Vayachavoshes Asono. And Bilam got up in the morning. And he, and he started to saddle his own donkey. Now that's, that's an amazing thing. Rashi over there says something amazing. He says, Mikan she'asinna mekakeles es hashura. From here we see that sinna, that hatred, messes up lines. What does that mean that it messes up lines? She'chava shuba atzmo. That he did it himself. Very strange. He was a very wealthy man. He had servants. He had a vodim that could have done it for him. Why did he do it? Because he wanted to show how much he hated Klal Yisrael. Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu, says Rashi, he's quoting the Medrash and the Gemara discussed in the Sanhedrin. Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Rasha, you wicked person. Kvar kidam Avram Avim. Avram, their forefathers already beat you to it. Shenemer, as it says, Vayashkim Avram Baboker, Vayachavoshes Chamoro, that Avram got up early in the morning and he saddled his own donkey. Sifsech Chamim explains that these are two things going together. He got up early, he didn't even wait for his Misharsim to do it. He got up so early because he wanted to go ahead and take care of this. Balak, you got up early. I'm sorry, Bilam, you got up early. You wanted to go and do a thing also to show what you can do to Kai Yisrael? Well, don't worry, my friend, let me. I mean, maybe you should worry. Klai Yisrael doesn't have to worry because already someone else beat you to it. Wow, John Havlicek, that's impressive. Or whatever whatever sports person we have, that's impressive that we go ahead and they do amazing you know, feats that they get up early and they do these things. But you know what? Kvar Kidamcha, there's someone who's already came before you that did such an idea, that got up early. That's what Preda. A Preda got up, he was always the first one in the base manager. No one's going to beat him to it. You know who else came along before that? Go way back to Avram Avinu. And like the Ramban explains, that we understand that Avram Avinu, what he did, he put the spiritual DNA into Klal Yisrael. And that that's the way that we're going to be. You think you're going to go and do something, you're going to beat me to it? We already beat you before you did it. And that's why the Gemara tells us also, similarly in Megillah, the Gemara says, Another going, Yud Gimel Mubeis, Amr Yishlakesh, Galoi V'yadu Lefnei Misha Amr V'haya Olam. It was known before the one who said, V'haya Olam, who the world should come to be, meaning HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Sha'asid Haman Lishko Shkalem Al Yisrael. Haman Bu was going to go ahead and separate Shkalem against B'nei Yisrael to go to try to kill them. Lefikach, therefore, Hikdim Shiklehim Lishkalav. He made their Shekel before his. He created the mitzvah of Machas Yitzah Shekel. V'hain V'dathnam, we have the Mishnah, Be'echer Ba'adam Hashmim Al Shkalem Bal and we go and we do these things. It's set up beforehand that we are going to be the ones that are going to take care of this. We're going to be before you even step up to do anything. It's already set in motion that, hey, we're doing what we got to be doing over here. My friends, here we are watching this game and you're seeing these athletes. I mean, we, I mean, to tell you the truth, I'm not watching it. And it's not because I'm so stark. I never, ever watched it. I just don't like it. Commercials I hear, but the rest of them, I don't know. I don't even know the commercials are kosher anymore. I'm not saying it's good, which is why you're watching this. Call a vote. But I'll say one thing. You see these people, and we have to learn and say, wow, look what they did. Look how they're getting up, and they're pushing themselves to do amazing feats, physical things which are above and beyond. And you look at a Bilam, and we went into above and beyond to do something. You look at Humanbu, we got up above and beyond to do something. But let me tell you something, Rasha, Kvar Kidamcha, there's already someone who did something before you. And that was the Klai Yisrael with the Shkalim, and, and the story of Prafreda in terms of, the way that he was always the first one in the base of Medrash, and Avram Avinu, who Vayashkim Avram Baboka Vayachav is just Chamoru. We have to make sure that we tap into something which we already have, like we discussed at Ramban. That is that DNA that Avram Avinu put inside of us, and make sure that we tap into Vayashkim Baboka, that we get up early in the morning, and that we push ourselves and we do what we can in order to make sure that we get closer to the Ribbono Shalom. Anu Amelim, Behem Amelim, Anu Ratzim, Behem Ratzim. Make sure that we're doing the proper things and make sure that we attach to it. The Ribbono Shalom 
should give us a bracha. Everyone should have the koach to be able to tap into this amazing gift that was already set in motion so many thousands of years ago. Bracha v'atzlacha. And I wish you know a lot of bracha to whichever team people want to be winning. I have no, absolutely no idea who was playing. <laughs> Zaga blessed. It was very difficult for me those days to say no to such an offer, but I, I remember the Nisoyan. It's extremely rare for someone to compose a song that becomes so famous and so widely accepted that it becomes the traditional holiday song for every Jewish family. 14 years ago, Yonatan Razel was married with a little girl living in Israel. He grew up in a very musical family. His father taught him how to play on the piano and on different instruments. He trained as a composer and a conductor. So when he got the call and he was invited to play and conduct at a concert abroad, he was really excited at the opportunity. The concert was in a big hall, the humongous orchestra, about 3,000 people. Baruch Hashem was a great success. And I came back home to Israel inspired, full of light. When he came home, he was in such a high from the success of that concert, he sat down at his piano and he started playing. And as soon as he started playing, this song came bursting through him. It was a song of a sentence that I always loved as a child and always connected to. And when the song finished, I kind of continued and screamed, like, almost like cried out with this melody. <laughs> I played that song to a few people. Nobody really got too excited about it. So I put it in the shelf and continued with my life. Fast forward two weeks, he gets a call from a man who introduces himself as an audience member at that concert that Jonathan conducted a couple of weeks earlier. He saw me singing and conducting and he said, uh, Jonathan, I feel that you can be um, very fit for this idea that I have in your career. And he basically offers Jonathan his dream career, fame, money, and opportunity. It was all there, a package deal. All Yonatan had to do was uproot his family, bring them to New York City, sign the dotted line, and he was on his way to success. I really wanted to do it. I felt it was the, you know, it was a very big call for me. Speaking it out with my wife and my Rav, I, I, I understood that certain aspects and parts, parts of it didn't a line, you know, I understood it wasn't 100% correct halakhically. It was very difficult for me those days to say no to such an offer, but I, I remember the Nisoyan, I felt that it wasn't the right thing to do. So I, I said, no, I'm sorry. And as he went back to Kolo, he's sitting with a friend of his, Chavrusa, who also is a composer in his own right, and they're talking about different songs, and the Chavrusa says, you know, I know a guy who's coming to Israel, he's looking, for Sephardic songs. He's producing a Sephardic album. And I'm thinking, you know, it might be a good shidduch between you and him. Maybe he can come to you and um, listen to some of your compositions. Maybe he'll be interested. So he made the shidduch between Yonatan Razel and Yaakov Shweki. So I sat for a few weeks, composed all kinds of tidbits of things. Yaakov Shweki and Yochi Briskman, his producer, walk into Yonatan Razel's studio in Israel. And we're sitting there in the studio. I was playing these songs and there wasn't really a click. They didn't like it. They're about to leave, and Yogi turns back at the last second, and he says, Yonatan, I'm wondering, do you have any other songs, shelf songs, they call it, that you composed maybe a while ago, and nobody heard it? It's not out there yet. And Bukh Hashem, I said to him, yeah, there's actually one song that I composed not so long ago. I don't know if you'd like it, I said, because, you know, it's not really Pesach now or whatever, and, but I'll play it for you. And then it was a bit different. It went like this. And then there was the chorus. At the end, I went to vocaliza, like a hard part.
And then uh, Brisbane, the producer, Yaakov's producer said to me, you know, I think I understood the problem of this song. The most important part of the words are Kadosh Baruch Hu Metzilenu Miyadam. That's the, that's the core, that's the heart of the song. That's the most important part of the words. Why don't you take the words, HaKadosh Baruch Hu Metzilenu Miyadam, that were in the first part of the song, in the verse, that were kind of almost hidden. Why don't you put them to the last part of the melody? And I said to him, you know, no offense, you're a producer, <laughs> I'm a musician, I don't think it's a good idea. So they were smarter than me, Baruch Hashem, and they, they recorded it and sent me the, the edited version. Not only that, it came with an offer. Why don't you come and sing with us? We have a concert in Kesaria biggest venue for artists in Israel. It was a very attractive offer for Yonatan because up until that point, Yonatan was just a conductor and a composer. He wasn't known as a singer yet. And the rest is history. Yonatan got into that stage and Shweki introduced him. Yonatan Rosel, I remember that moment. You know, there's some things you know as an artist, that magical moment when you know something big for you, maybe for the world is happening. I felt that it was Hashem saying, Yonatan, he said no to this offer a few months ago. You understood that it wasn't the right thing for you as a Jewish artist to do. So instead, it can all come in a kosher way. It can all happen in a way that'll add Kiddush Hashem. I played this song to soldiers coming out of Gaza, to prime ministers, presidents. It's a reminder that we never have to compromise our values in the pursuit of success. HaKadosh Baruch Hu has a million different ways in which he can make us successful. Looking back, that opportunity that didn't align with Yonatan's values was a test. And as soon as he passed that with flying colors, HaKadosh Baruch Hu opened another door. And that's how V'hi Shamda came into the world. <laughs> Now